Welcome to the Ford Bacon Home at the corner of Biddle Avenue and Vinewood Street in Wyandotte, Michigan. This structure is listed on both the National and State Register of Historic Places. The Queen Anne style mansion has many of the atmospheric trappings of a baronial manor. It was built by the Ford family who made their fortune in the plate glass industry and came to Wyandotte to establish the Michigan Alkali Company which continues today as BASF Wyandotte. Built in 1897-98 on four city lots, the house has eight bed bedrooms, six bathrooms, two parlors, pantries, a library, and a billiard room, and seems a living ad abductation from the board game Clue. Designed by Detroit architectural firm of Malcolmson and Higginbotham, the house has 27 rooms, 11 fireplaces, and 5,000 square feet on each of its four levels. The tip typical of the Queen Anne style, the building has an asymmetrical facade, wraparound porch, dentals, classical columns, bay windows, leaded windows, monumental chimneys, and originally a slate roof. The stately structure is graced with oak paneled rooms, built-in bookcases, imposing fireplaces, and a stained glass window. There is a dank cellar with a cistern that has not seen the light of day since anyone can remember, a number of cobweb nooks and crannies that are seldom disturbed. The upper regions include a tower ascending to a fourth level, an enormous attic with rafters vaulting so high it's difficult to see the peak, the roof displays a gothic landscape of gables, dormers, finial lightning rods soaring skyward, skyward, two lifelike owls perched like gargoyles peering down from the heights. All of these features spark speculation that the house is haunted, but other than a few creaks and groans, the old house keeps its secrets to itself. Let's take a tour of the Ford Bacon home and see these and many other features and discover how a wealthy family lived in Wyandotte at the turn of the 20th century. Well, welcome to the Ford Bacon Home. Uh, since 1942, this has been the public library in Wyandotte, uh, originally built uh, by the Ford family, and uh, one of the Ford daughters was Mary Ford, who married Mark Bacon, and this house was given to her as a wedding present. In 1905, the Bacons moved into the house Hence the name Ford Bacon House. You can see the elevator over here. This was added in the year 2007. And uh, so it was one of the newer things. That, uh, this was a small garden in the earlier days. And uh, to my left here was, which is now the uh, more modern addition to the library, used to be their backyard. We're standing on what was the back porch to the mansion. And let's go into the house and take the uh, tour. We're in the main hallway, first floor of the Bacon house. Uh, Mr. Bacon always uh, arranged for fresh flowers to be up in this hallway, and there was a couch over here. And on this little side hallway, which we'll move over here, I want to point out this piece of furniture, this little display cabinet. This is the only piece of furniture left from the Bacon family in the entire house. When they moved to California, they took their own furniture with them. And this side door here, on the outside there used to be a, a, carry, a bricked, arched carriage port, so that the carriage, or later the car, could move under a, a uh, partition there that kept them out of the rain, they would step up the steps and into the house. And like most families, the family usually used the side entrance rather than the main door. And now we'll go into the next room, which was the library of the house. We're in the library now, and as you see, one of the nice features is our leaded, leaded glass bookcases that line both sides of the room a built-in uh, letter writing desk and as you will see from the picture on top there uh, President Clinton sitting at that desk 
when he visited the library in 1996. He stayed here for three hours, gave a speech out front to a few thousand people, and it was quite an experience to, uh, to uh, witness the preparations and the visit, uh, one of the more uh, notable days in the history of the library. And another feature that can't be missed is the fireplace. You'll see that uh, of all the 11 fireplaces in the house, they, they have a completely different look as far as the mirror, the fire bag, the mantles. And this was used mostly by Mark Bacon, a place to uh, read or study after dinner. Now we'll go into the dining room of the home. Most of the wood in the first floor of the house is oak. However, this room is mahogany. It, would, it was featured with a silver trim back when the family lived here. And here's a nice uh, built-in buffet and, and mirror, and more leaded glass uh, bookcases. And even the windows over there are uh, bottom leaded glass. And uh, one feature here is you can see that this is, this is a working building now, not a museum. We have uh, uh, activities in this room, craft building activities and projects going on here all the time. And so you will see that it's not designed to look at the way that it did when the family lived here, but rather the needs of the uh, 21st century. This is the butler's pantry. It connects the kitchen to the dining room. Uh, one feature I wanted to show is, is a pass-through. This door slides up, and someone in the kitchen can slide food or dishes through to the servant who is going to present the food to the people in the dining room. And here we have a cabinet which has a little special feature. You, note, you may note that the shelves are metal and underneath is a radiator. This would be a plate warmer or a food warmer to uh, keep things in preparation before bringing them out to the table. A small pantry off the kitchen is the location of the ice box. This it goes all the way back to the wall there, so you have two large panels on either side, and in the middle, a smaller door this door was the size of an ice block. The, the ice would be cut on the Detroit River, stored in a warehouse on, near Oak Street, and an ice man, horse and buggy ice man, would deliver it to the outside of the bacon house. There's a metal stairway that the ice man would mount, and a, a similar square door in the outer wall, he would slip the ice into that, this container here, and he, that's delivering the ice without having to come into the home. And in here, the compartment's very thick doors to keep the cool in. This is no electricity um, back in the 1897. And a large compartment with glazed tiles to store the food. We're in the kitchen and the uh, sink, the cupboards are all fairly new. It's just a matter of functionality. The old ones were needed replacing to operate as a, as a library. And But I want to point out where the modern stove is. We have a picture of how things looked in the early 1950s with the old stove still, still seen in the background. And if you look up, you can see where the plate is high on the wall where the stove pipe used to exit. And over here in the corner, there, there's a faint outline yet of a door, that would be a utility door, for the uh, deliveries and to take the trash out of the house. That's long gone when they built the new addition in the backyard in 1962. This is the parlor, the front parlor of the home, uh, essentially a, a living room. And one feature I'd like to point out are the three windows, bay window type of uh, area. Not only does the wall curve, but each piece of glass is curved glass too. The family, uh, the Ford family, was part of the 
plate glass industry and uh, they owned their own glass company so they could afford to buy custom made glass and have it installed. This room, will, in the, this used to be the reference room in the 1940s, 50s, early 60s. Uh, we're in the billiard room now and uh, in the early days they had a billiard table in here. Later on this was the children's room. Uh, this room uh, was for many years the children's room. If, if anyone came to the library in the 1940s, 50s, 60s, one feature which is kind of unique to this is the uh, built-in book racks, which are more than that. There is a space for the cues to fit in here. You can see the circular part at the bottom and where the cue would stand up and finish up here at the top. There is a fireplace. The only fireplace which is no longer in view is behind this bookcase. Uh, we'll be seeing We've seen and we'll be seeing some other fireplaces throughout the tour. Uh, all of these books in this room, which is about a couple thousand, were donated by Max Schwartz. Max was a history buff. He was a veteran, a Navy veteran, and he gave us all these books which feature military history, uh, Americana, American crafts like tinsmithing and muzzle loading, that sort of thing. And he also donated real Civil War artifacts to us, as you can see in the display case there. A couple of Union hats, a bayonet, um, some bullets, and a uh, powder horn, and some other, some other items that are all genuine from the 1860s. And uh, now we'll move on to the next spot in our tour. The main entrance to the home on Biddle Avenue uh, you can see it's a heavy oak door with leaded glass on either side. And if we open it up and look at the uh, vestibule, you will see that there's mosaic tiles on the floor. We're on the front porch of the house, and uh, on my left is Biddle Avenue, the main entrance to the house, and uh, a seating area which the Although that's not original furniture, the family uh, used this area for the same purpose. And for some years it was a screened in porch on this section. The porch actually wraps around on the middle uh, Vinewood Avenue side and goes down for some distance. This room uh, across from the front parlor is called the reception room. Mark Bacon was a lawyer and a politician and uh, this is where his clients would wait for him. As you can see, there's an, an yet another bay window configuration here. You'll see others throughout the house as we go along. And over here, the fireplace. This is the largest fireplace in the house. It's really quite mammoth. And a window seat in the corner. Kind of a, a nifty feature about this is that it has storage in it. A little something that I'm sure that the uh, kids would play with. The Bacons had two young sons who grew up in this house. You're going to see the, the very grand main staircase, how the uh, banisters spiral at the bottom, and it leads up to a landing with a, a beautiful stained glass window. We're on the second floor now. This is the top of the main staircase. And, of course, the beautiful stained glass window that had to be sent out for renovation about 20 years ago, but it's holding up nicely now. And if you notice the light fixtures on the walls here, you, you'll see the electric light bulbs, two of them, but at the top, something that looks like a candle, that's actually a gas jet. When they built the house, 1897, electricity was fairly well established by then, but they chose to keep the older lighting method of gas, whether that was for uh, nostalgia or convenience or as a backup to electricity, which was maybe not quite as reliable back then, we don't know, but they had the two systems together. We're in one of the six bedrooms on the second floor. This would be the bedroom that a house guest would stay in. It was decorated with Ford and Bacon family heirlooms and photographs. 
You can see a very pretty image of the uh, fireplace that exists in this room, very cozy. And over here on the wall is a button that could be pressed, and a servant would know to come to this room and see what the person wanted. The uh, servant's call box was in the kitchen, and uh, it had a little dial, something like a combination doorbell servant's call box, and it would ring and it would say North Chamber, and the servant would know to go to that room. This is uh, yet another bedroom on the second floor. In the early days, this may have been uh, the family's master bedroom, and later they moved to the back of the house. You have to consider that even in the early days, before automobiles were popular, Biddle Avenue carried a lot of horses and wagons, which were quite noisy, and even the trolley lines that ran down Biddle Avenue were very noisy, and there was probably uh, a lot of uh, smell from all that traffic, too. This room now is used as a meeting room, and it displays a lot of the Ford and Bacon family history, including genealogies, uh, pictures of uh, Mark and Mary Bacon, and other people, including Heloise Bacon, who was the aunt. Heloise Bacon moved to, to California, never really lived in this house, but visited often. She moved to California, and uh, had a mansion there near the Pacific. And uh, today, Oprah Winfrey lives in that mansion. The Bacons themselves uh, eventually did move. Well, Mark died in 1942, and Mary moved permanently to California about that time and donated the building to the Wyandotte Public Schools to be used as a public library. And we were connected, the library was connected to the schools until about 1994, when it became an independent, or what they call a district library. In this room, there's some, uh, lots of interesting photos uh, related to the library or the family. Here is a picture of the construction of the library edition in 1962. And you can see the back of the mansion, the tower looking like a four-story, tower should, and a lot of construction in the backyard, which is being dug up. Even here, the, uh, the service entrance to the kitchen, which I mentioned earlier, you can see that from an outside looking in. And it looks like a 1959 or 60 Chevy here. And down here is the vacant houses seen from Biddle Avenue. And one thing I want to point out here, well, actually a couple of things, the uh, carriage port that I mentioned earlier, brick structure, that the car could just come in and park underneath and be protected from the weather. But also here, and it might be hard to see, but perching above these, this dormer on the top floor are two gargoyles. Those gargoyles are no longer there, and we don't know what happened, but whatever it was, it was many, many, many decades ago that they we lost track of them. One more thing, a very nice picture. This is the chauffeur of the Bacon family coming out of the Ford Bacon house in a um, 1910 Winston automobile. And in the background, the McNichol home, which is the present home of the Wyandotte Museum. The third bedroom on the second floor, another unique looking fireplace. And this, in the early years, was the bedroom for one of the uh, four daughters. They had two daughters, Mary, who married Mark Bacon, and Laura, who married George McNichol. And uh, for her wedding gift, Laura got the McNichol house, which is now the museum. And Mary got this house, the or bacon home. Over here are a lot of old style card catalogs, which some of you may be familiar with, at least in the movies, if nothing else. Uh, nowadays, of course, computers do the same job, but today we use these for local history. 
if your practice is especially good, if your family is a long time Wyandotte family, we can look up if their name ever appeared in the newspaper. And uh, it, a lot of people use this, a, a thousand people every year probably use this to do genealogy, local history. Even sometimes we get, uh, you know, uh, police doing research on various things. And uh, more of that here. Thousands, tens of thousands of names. And since 1995, instead of the old fashioned card catalogs, it's computerized. And so those names and events and anything of note that we want to record for local history is now looked up on the computer. A fourth bedroom on the second floor. Uh, and again, in the early years, one of the uh, uh, four daughters had this as her bedroom. Now it's again a, another a local history room. You can see the two microfilm, microfiche reader printers. And this cabinet contains the old newspapers from Wyandotte on microfilm. From, we have them from about 1880 to the present. Uh, not only are the old papers recorded, but even last week's News Herald would be recorded, eventually microfilmed, and available for research. So if you ever appear in the newspapers, you might be recorded here in our local history room. And over here goes back to the days when the family was here, a beautiful fireplace and sitting area. A fifth bedroom on the second floor, and as you can see, by the desks, computer, computers, printers, and all the par paraphernalia of a working place, not just an old home museum. The, uh, but this is one of the lighter rooms in the house, and we believe that the, the family uses it as a master bedroom in the later years. And it faces the uh, river on, the, uh, on this side to my left, so that in the morning it's really beautiful room with the sun streaming in. This is the sixth bedroom on the second floor. And uh, you can see the fireplace in this room is miniature. This was a nursery when the two Bacon boys were very young. Uh, and um, even before that, though, when the grandfather of the family came, uh, J.B. Ford, he was given this room as a guest room. He was the one who made the family fortune, and although he never lived in Wyandotte, when he came here, I'm sure they took good care of him. And attached to his room was a little sun room over here, which has a great view of the river. Let's go in here for a minute. This is the sun room uh, attached to that sixth bedroom, and even though it's been raining most of the day, the sun is out now to demonstrate how bright and cheerful this little room can be. We're on the third floor now, and this room is called the Cedar Room because it's not only are the cabinets made of cedar, but so are the walls and the ceiling. So, so out of season clothing would be stored here. Right now, of course, it's just used for storage, a lot of library programs and seasonal programs. And so it's a little cluttered, but uh, it has still the great view of the river of that window. And this room is directly below the open air tower. Uh, sometimes people refer to our tower as a bell tower. No, it, no, no bell has ever been there. It's an observational tower. The family used it to catch a cool breeze on a hot day and to just observe the river traffic. Let's go up and have a look. We're in the tower right now, and it's essentially one story higher than the attic. It's an open-air tower. On all four sides, there are screened-in large openings. So on a hot day, this is a cool place to hang out. And the view of the river, very striking from up here. We're in the third floor, one of the two servants' bedrooms on this level. And one thing I wanted to point out to you here is the speaking tube in the wall. So if a servant in the kitchen wanted the servant up here to come down and help with something or ask them a question, they would 
move right in up to the speaking tube and essentially uh, shout out what they wanted and the person up here would have their ear to this tube so it's an intercom no electricity just voice traveling through a tube and they would communicate with each other we're in the attic now it's an enormous attic with plenty of room mostly they use it for storage some people think this was a ballroom at one point but probably not but there, will, there is a unique feature to this room, and that is here it is a structure built out of wood which was added a little bit later, maybe in the 20s. It's a photographic dart room. One of the Bacon boys was an amateur photographer, liked to get into developing his own photos. And in, on, behind this window here is a sink, and uh, also able to close off the entire area to create a dark room for his processing. Again in the attic, I want to point out all of this hardware, this equipment, air, handle, air handlers, ventilators, and all kinds of stuff. It's amazing how, how much equipment they took to create geothermal heating. And they dug about 20 wells in our side yard, and they went down several hundred feet, and they dug up many trenches in the side yard in order to uh, connect the piping necessary to bring uh, heat from, from under the earth into the library so that we're not dependent on natural gas or any other way of outside heating. Okay. We're in the basement now. Really, it's an unfinished cellar and kind of creepy, but here's one feature I want to point out. This manhole cover is the entrance to a cistern, which is a chamber for catching rainwater and it was diverted to a, t a tank down there and it, of course it would not be used for drinking but it probably was used for various uh, washing of surfaces or maybe watering the lawn it's hard to say but uh, they had a sort of a natural uh, rain barrel kind of situation with the cistern. Again in the cellar this is the laundry room and Probably the most unique feature here is a clothes dryer, 1897 style. As you can see, it's a large structure. What would happen is, if this black box on the side, a fire would be built with coal, probably, or coke, which is similar to coal, only a little cleaner. And the heat would be channeled into this chamber. And we have, <coughs> have an area to hang clothes. And as you see, it has many of these pullouts which are, you're able to hang clothes over. In fact, these things extend out so far that even bed sheets can be put on these and dried in uh, the winter time or inclement weather. And over here in the corner, we have a baler, this big iron piece that looks like it's uh, a hundred years old, in fact, it is over a hundred years old. And the baler, of course, we're not on a farm out here, the baler was used as, as a trash compactor. And it was a manual, you can see the large hand crank on the side. And what, their trash would be eventually taken away, but they uh, had the ability to compact it and store it for a while. And one other feature in the laundry room is a servant's restroom. Of course the servants would not use the same bathroom as the masters of the house. In the cellar in the front room we have a curious foundation. You can see it's rock as it moves around in a semicircle, and we believe that's actually a remnant from the first house which was on this location. And that house was moved when this was built in 1897. A feature of the outside of the house I'd like to point out, a small wooden door here, and it's the entrance to the underside of the wraparound porch. So an interesting fact about that is that when President Clinton was here in 1996, they of course had to search all the grounds for any hazards, planted bombs or any other hazards. Two Secret Service guys 
had to take off their jackets, put on uh, overalls, and crawl along this slimy pathway that had not been disturbed in uh, decades, uh, probably, to make sure that all was clear.